The Brexit party are back, baby. Only now they're called reform and they're not just all about Brexit anymore. If you cast your mind back to the hazy reaches of last week, you might remember party leader Richard Tice delivering a speech setting out his stall for the coming general election. He promised lower taxes, net zero immigration, cheaper energy and zero NHS waiting lists. And I'm sure that moon on a stick will be coming along any day now. Some people smirked at Reform's PowerPoint presentation. But look at that graphic design! I mean, the Photoshop work! Don't think that either Labour or the Conservatives will ever be able to recover from this. In reality, the important part of Richard Tice's speech was this. I'm optimistic that the country quite rightly wants to punish the Tories for breaking Britain, because that is what they want to do. I think the country wants to punish them, to oust them and replace them. The question is what we replace them with. Now, three years ago, when I launched Reform UK, the Tories laughed at me. They said, why are you bothering? We're getting it sorted. And to coin an expression from my good friend Nigel in the European Parliament, they're not laughing now. No, the truth is, the Tories are terrified. Yes, in the new year, the special pleading has already started. Oh, please don't stand here. Please don't stand there. I'm one of the nice guys. I believe in all everything that you believe in. You've all broken Britain. You're all responsible. So there's no special deals. We stand in every single seat in England, Scotland and Wales. Why that's important, of course, is that in 2019, the Brexit party used standing against the Conservatives in marginal constituencies as leverage to get them to commit to a much tougher Brexit position. They eventually stood down. This time around, Richard Tice is effectively saying there's no policy position you can take to buy us off. Standing in every seat in Great Britain, of course, requires fielding a lot of candidates. So many, in fact, that reform have been a little bit sloppy with their due diligence. Here's Richard Tice being grilled by Nick Ferrari on LBC this morning. Maggie Moriando, who's your candidate in Bedford. Anyone who still believes in climate change is unfortunately blinded by ideology and a lack of critical thinking skills. Uh, Andrew Husband, who's going to stand in North Durham. It's a scam. And we also have Sean Matthews, who'll be in Louth and Newcastle. There is no climate crisis. Well, These that, are your candidates who totally disagree with you. No, they don't. Actually, that last point... I'm po- so sorry. Uh, Nick, the, hang the, on, that last point, there, right, there isn't a climate tri- crisis, I, right? There is climate change, of right. course. The key thing is, no, is how you respond to it, Nick. We should adapt but to it. Maggie Moriondo says it's a scam and you lack critical thinking skills if you support it. Have but, you spoken to Maggie? Look, everybody will have different opinions. Our, our party oh dear, policy... we're not a very united band, are we? Well, it's like any political party. You'll have different views across the whole range of perspectives. The key point is you have to adapt to climate change. Anybody who thinks you can stop climate change, I don't think, is actually uh, listening to what the IPCC says. They say You're... that... Hang on, hear me out. Of course. They say Sorry. that even if we get to net zero tomorrow, it'll make no difference to sea level rise for between 200 and 1,000 years. The smart thing to do is to adapt to it rather than, I think, foolhardily think that you can stop climate change. All you right. can't. Let's come back to Louth and Horncastle, your candidate, Sean Matthews. He's a colourful chap, isn't he? Do you know Sean? Do you know him well? Uh, I don't know. Nick, we've got about 500 candidates, so I don't share, know each and every, every one of you. Uh, just over a year ago. It's no surprise children want to remove their penises and become girls. Most of their parents started the process shortly after birth by chopping their foreskins off in the name of, brackets, insert deity, close brackets. He's a reform candidate. Uh, news to me, I shall look at that. Thank you, Nick. Is that the sort of candidate you want? No, we, look, we, we are very clear. If anybody says or writes something that is daft and inappropriate, then we will look at that and form a very quick view. And actually, that's one of the advantages as a... Uh, as a lean party with a, a clear right. uh, management structure, we can make very fast decisions. So lastly, before we go to calls, uh, again, Andrew Husband, North Durham, Ukraine was media hype. It was Ukraine media hype. Look, look Ukraine, sadly, has been invaded by Russia and we've got to do all we can to support Ukraine in uh, in trying to defend its sovereign territory. And lastly, Maggie Moriondo, we go back to Bedford, 
Um, COVID scam was paid by Big Pharma to lie to us. So COVID was a scam as well, was it? COVID was very real. Of course it was. Well, and, 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 COVID, and COVID, COVID is... That, that took my colleague five minutes to look at their tweets. Why aren't you doing a proper background check? We're, we're doing checks. And, in, and You're doing checks? We're doing checks. And if there, are people, if there are people that are inappropriate, then uh, we would obviously remove them. And look, so, with, let's be so very clear. we need clear. a review of candidates, don't we, at reform? That is, that is ongoing all the time. Every party is always ongoing vetting their candidates and occasionally well, people will say the wrong thing, say something daft. <laughs> we did this in under an hour. Aaron, we saw an awful lot of this with disgraced UKIP and Brexit party candidates being found to have, you know, tweeted racist things or, you know, holding to conspiracy theories. But that didn't really impact the electoral strategy of either UKIP and the Brexit party. So do you think that Nick Ferrari's line of question questioning is kind of missing the point here? Partly, but also reform is a different beast to the Brexit Party and UKIP because, of course, they were just a sing they were single party, single issue parties. Um, well, look, we might disagree or agree on this. It doesn't matter. We want to leave the European Union. We want a referendum. We want the referendum respected. Um, so I think it probably does matter to some extent. Now, of course, what Tice is saying there is that there is disagreement within any large party. That's true. The issue is reform is not a large party. You know, when you have a, a, a party membership like under Jeremy Corbyn with Labour, half a million plus, yes, of course, uh, reform isn't that. And I do find it strange that they're looking to stand candidates in every single constituency. I think that really, to me, betokens the fact that they're not a very serious organisation. What would make far more sense would be to stand 30 candidates in Tory seats, 30 candidates in uh, Labour seats, and to have a very specific, clear message. Spreading thin and, and having lots of people lose their deposit Okay, it's uh, it's a good headline. We're standing in every seat. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really go very far most of the time. Also, that poster that we saw a moment ago of, um, you know, the new party being embodied half by this Harlequin, half by uh, Keir Starmer, half by Rishi Sunak, doesn't mean anything to anybody. Most people look at that. And go, what what am I looking? Is that is that a poster for the the Joker uh, sequel? What the hell is this? It doesn't mean anything to most people. Um, and it is interesting that at the very moment, actually, I think we're looking at incredibly fertile terrain for a populist party of the right. The Tories and Labour are fortunate enough that the leader of it is Richard Tyers, who frankly is no Nigel Farage. Um, that said, I think reform will do OK. You know, I think they'll, they, they could break 5% at a general election. I think that's unlikely. I mean, that would be an extraordinary achievement if they do, by the way. But they could get a couple of percent in a general election, and that is going to cost the Tories potentially dozens of seats. Now, the joker in the pack here is if Nigel Farage returns to frontline politics, stands as a candidate or even leads them, I find the leading thing unlikely. Though, of course, he does own this operation. Very strange corporate structure. He does own it. Um, if Farage was leading them into the next election, um, then, you know, they could get 5% plus and actually that Tory quagmire, that Tory Waterloo could get a whole lot worse, you know, fewer than 100 seats. I don't foresee that happening, frankly. It could happen, though. It's plausible. Um, but I think you know, Richard Tice is not uh, the kind of political beast you want in an era of populism. You know, he's talking, they're Thatcherite talking points, you know. They're all socialists. We want lower taxes, 15-minute cities. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get what drove the success of Brexit. He doesn't get what drove the success of Boris Johnson in 2019. This strange fusion of, of red UKIP politics, immigration, looking after public services, a hatred, frankly, of London, um, which goes hand in hand with something which is progressive, i.e. addressing regional inequality. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get blue collar Britain. Um, he doesn't get the fact that actually lots of minorities voted for Brexit, one in three. He doesn't, he doesn't get lots of this stuff. And it's interesting because the people in that orbit, you know, it's not just Farage, someone like Ben Habib or Stephen Wolfe back in the day, they were, I don't agree with them politically, but they're impressive figures. They're impressive figures. Richard Tice isn't that. Um, so, you know, they could do well. They could uh, spring a surprise. Uh, but I very much doubt it. And it is intriguing that now, you know, I've seen on the BBC, I think BBC Radio 4 uh, last week, the story of Richard Tice, the leader of the Brexit party. 
when did you do that about Carla Denya? After all, she's leading the Green Party of England and Wales, who have an MP, right? Who, uh, I think they're in coalition and they run one council. Um, and I think they're in coalition for another or minority with another. But regardless, they're very prominent in local government. They're looking to win several seats in the next election. Look, if they win one more, great. But they'll be competitive in four. They'll be competitive in four seats. So you're not talking about the life story of Carla Denya or Adrian Ramsey, but you are for Richard Tice. I wonder why. You know, without that, um, without that uh, megaphone given to Richard Tice by, of course, other parts of the media, tabloids, GB News, Talk TV. You know, he was on Talk TV. Now he's on GB News. Without that megaphone, they wouldn't be going very far. Of course, look, those are private businesses. They can do what they want within the confines of media regulation. However, it is particularly strange that a public service broadcaster like the BBC would seek to elevate him so much when politicians who lead parties who are fundamentally more successful don't get the same kind of uh, hand up. You have to ask why.